Hi, everyone. Welcome back. You are listening to the Armed and Nerded podcast, the place where we do deep dives on freedom-related topics. And today's topic, a lot of people like to build their own ARs, right? Many of you listening have done your own. And the question from the audience is, are you overbuilding those rifles? And that's what we're going to be talking about here today. I remember my first AR. It was very expensive to me then, and even by today's standards, it was uh, fairly expensive as far as ARs are concerned. But the thing was, it was utter basic, and you got to think about the climate of the time. Uh, Obama had just become president of the United States. There's a huge buying craze going on. It was hard to find any components. It literally took eight months to get the parts. Utterly ridiculous by today's standards. I still have that rifle, although it's been through multiple barrel changes at this point in time, and I look at that rifle and the concept of that firearm, and I would classify it as definitely underbuilt initially, because, well, I mean, I had to fix it after the fact. And that's okay. If you buy a rifle and you want to do some stuff to it, or if you want to roll your own, I look back at that, and I learned so much from doing that, that I would not be where I am today in my journey if I hadn't gone through and learned stuff the hard way. So I absolutely advocate you going out and tinkering and learning. It's a, it's a pretty safe process. There's not a whole lot to mess up. A lot of people think that, you know, they work on ARs and they think that they've done something. And that that's kind of like a continuous joke in the industry. Uh, Glocks and ARs. Uh, people think that they're good at stuff or they're handy based on their ability to work on those things. And they are not a good indicator on, on whether you are good at this type of stuff or not. But that aside, spending the time and and energy and and customizing your own stuff, learning how things kind of go together and interact to form a functioning firearm, uh, it can take you a long way, especially when it comes down to the part of the life cycle of the gun where you need to start performing preventative maintenance. You kind of already know how all that stuff goes together, and it helps you diagnose what might be wrong with it down the road. So what I would tell you first off is don't get stuck on what marketing is telling you. It's going to change on a cyclical basis and that cycle uh, usually right after the year's kickoff marketing meeting. Don't get me wrong, I'm a capitalist, but there's a machine that is designed to separate you from your money and it's great because it's really efficient at informing you of what's out there and what the possibilities are, but you need to recognize it for what it is. And I sort of equate the value of that to a post-secondary education. Uh, Those of you who have been following on the VSO Gun channel have heard me say this before. I have a degree in the hard sciences. My major was biological sciences. My minor was chemistry. I was a chemist for many years uh, out of school in various industries. Uh, I don't believe that everyone needs a post-secondary education, and I would find that uh, many people would find it less valuable than, than learning a trade in hindsight being 2020. But one of the things that I think is exceptional about a post-secondary education is that many people at that stage in their life, if you think, you know, late teens, early 20s, have not had any uh, intensive training on how to leverage the cognitive aspects of their mind. So the critical thinking skills, the the problem solving, the ability to rationalize that at that point in your in your life you haven't done a whole lot of exercise in, particularly if you are publicly educated as I was. So the value, conditioning you to use your mind in a big way. The downside, at that stage when you're in there mucking around with things, there's a huge capacity for indoctrination because you've basically got a blob of mush that is the brain that doesn't know how to do a whole lot of things. So it's really easy to condition it to think a particular way. So what I would say is that the parallel that I'm trying to draw here is that you can be tricked by the uh, the marketing machine that you need to get these things, that you need to spend your hard-earned money on these things to keep up with the times. And the reality is that about Three quarters of the stuff that comes out in the gun world is utterly worthless. And if you see the machine for what it is, then you can realize that they're trying to trap you in that uh, that loop, and then you can use it against them. 
I was like the the argumentative one, the uh, the token conservative in the room, and I always sat in the front row, mostly because the way I learned lend itself to sitting in the front row. But I had several uh, professors that were that were pretty good spirited about it, and they liked to have people to debate with. And I will say that I I, I worked them over pretty good on a regular basis. That's the thing about uh, always having yes men in your class is when you don't have a yes man, a, a lot of the times you you, uh, you dull. That whole iron sharpens iron type situation. And you can figure that given uh, where we are today, that that particular concentration didn't have a whole lot of, uh, shall we say, free thinkers available. So what I'm saying to you is just try to separate the marketing from the real world and understand that most of the time when we're talking about innovations in the firearms space, we're talking about an incremental increase of fractions of percentages. Until we start making like phasers and blasters and stuff like that, you can pretty much assume that the capabilities of the rifle that you would purchase today is gonna be the same roughly in 10 years, plus or minus a few percentage points. One of the things that drives change is instances where the government gets out of the way of something. So this whole thing with the pistol braces, if it goes down the way that I hope that it does, uh, we could see the recalibration of concentrations towards the shorter guns. And that might result in something that uh, is unforeseen in my mind at this point in time. That said, the industry has been working on shorter is better for a while now. So now that I've gone down a road that makes the topic uh, all that more nebulous, I, I want you to think about uh, the firearm outside of the traditional metal and lines, this piece, that piece, this trigger, that stock, et cetera, et cetera. And I want you to go with me on the defining characteristic of a firearm, which is it is a delivery mechanism. It is a delivery mechanism for a particularly sized piece of metal at a particular speed. And when we break it down like that, what we're talking about is energy delivery to a target. So what caliber is sufficient? Well, as many of you are saying, well, that really depends on what it is that we're doing with it. If we're out there hunting rhinos, that's completely different than if we're target shooting. In a self-defense context, as in versus humans, just about anything will do. Many of you were like, what did you just say? Humans are really shitty animals. Think about it for a second. We don't run very fast. We don't have sharp claws. We don't have sharp teeth. We're susceptible to the cold. We aren't very heavy. We're not very strong. We can't see in the dark. Our vitals have very little shielding. We have very thin hide and our cortex plays far too big a role in the electrical system of our bodies. Well, humans can't suck at everything, Kurt. How on earth did we become the apex predator on the planet if we're not very good at anything? Well, what are we good at? Uh, we sweat. So thermoregulation is our game. A, a human can't outrun really anything of substance, but we can out-endurance it. Think about it. You go to the zoo, what's everything doing? Sleeping, right? Humans can push their activity levels as needed, especially through continuous adaptive training. We have upright bilateral symmetry with forward-facing eyes, making us predators that are specialized for melee and ranged combat. We have opposable thumbs, which sounds pretty basic uh, because it is, but the uh, main thing that most people will cite when it comes to uh, opposable thumbs is tool use, which is somewhat applicable here uh, when we're talking about specifically building tools, but chimps can use tools too. And in fact, you can teach them to do some remarkable and complex things. But have you ever seen a chimpanzee or an orangutan throw? The sickliest human will outthrow the most elite chimp every single time. And it's been that way for at least 350,000 years. Pair that with the supercomputer that is the human brain and you get the unique trait of being able to find the center of anything. And we have an aptitude to tell you approximately how off-centered things are. Case in point, take the human eye. Uh, the human eye for our purposes discussing here today is made up of two big circles, the sclera and the iris. If you are standing in a department store, you can tell if somebody's looking at you from across the room. In fact, you are so good at telling if somebody's looking at you that you can tell whether they are looking at you or the display that is next to you. This is not an insignificant thing, and we have some considerations here in how we build our weapons. In a nutshell, that's about all humans are good at, and we'll 
revisit those ones that we just discussed a little bit later in the show. I wanted to lay the groundwork, though. But the point that we're talking about now is caliber. And humans have become the apex predator through a series of technological integrations. A human will not fist fight a grizzly bear, or at least not successfully. But put the right caliber firearm in their hand, and there's really no contest. So the solve for this, or the uh, formula, so to speak, would go something like this. We have a bullet of a particular mass that arrives at a sufficient velocity times the number of shots needed per unit time. So what makes up that time component? Is it the desire to shoot more, like you're playing a gun game or something like that, and you need to hit more targets? Or is it urgency? Maybe you're about to be run down by a Cape Buffalo and you need to get a few shots off so that you don't get smashed into a grease spot that can be scraped up off the ground and buried in a paper sack. If you're going pronghorn hunting, you don't need a 300 Winchester Magnum because they're tough animals. You needed to get the bullet there. In that instance, you trade fast follow-up shots for accuracy and reach. You might want to trade that back if you're hunting other predators, particularly ones that outweight class you. But for the sake of discussion, since we're on about ARs, we can assume that it, that isn't the case and we're using intermediate cartridges. And in that instance, I think it's useful when talking about what is overbuilt that we define first what is underbuilt. I've seen my fair share of underbuilt guns. The default for an AR-15 is 5.56, 223, whatever designation you want to use, a 223 wild, chambering, etc., etc. Most rifles are more than capable of handling that, no problem. There used to be a thing for a while when people were talking about 223 versus 5.56 guns and all that sort of stuff. By today's standards, you don't really have to worry about that sort of stuff. Well, you say, Kurt, there's a whole bunch of other intermediate cartridges out there. What about those? So... I think that this is a really good place to talk about some of the uh, shortcomings of some of the other intermediate cartridges in the AR. And I'm going to make a lot of people mad. 762 by 39 does not belong in an AR-15. At least not in its standard configuration. And the reason that is, is if you look at the rear diameter, the head stamp on a 762 by 39 cartridge, it is much wider than that of a 5.56 cartridge. And if you compare the bolt geometry from a 7.62 bolt to a 5.56 bolt, you will find paper thin walls when you're talking about the 7.62 gun. And especially if you're shooting the steel case stuff through your AR, there's a huge potential here to damage the bolt face of your weapon. And we're not talking just a little bit out of sync, we're talking shut the gun down broken. You need look no further than extractor breakage on normal AR-15s. Sometimes you'll have extractors that run for tens and tens of thousands of rounds, and then you have others that come right out of the box and break in the first 20. Those things are pretty thick in relative comparison to the sidewalls of your 762 by 39 bolt, and it's just not a good way to build guns. And my advice to you is that if you want to shoot 762 by 39 out of a modern ergonomics weapon, like the AR, that you look at those hybrid platforms that have tried to do it. The really good example of one, even though I'm not paid to say this, is the CMMG uh, firearm. It is built on a 308 bolt. That gives you a lot more meat to play with because you're talking about something that was originally designed for 308 and you're using it for 762 by 39. The other problem with 762 by 39 is the magazines. The magazines have always sucked and there have been some efforts in recent years to revamp this idea. But what it comes down to is the AR-15 magazine has to fit in the magwell, and that means it has to be straight. So what you end up with is a straight feed magazine and then an extreme curve to compensate for the massive taper that exists in that 762 by 39 round that is one of its strengths, don't get me wrong, and it's an integral part in how those firearms function so well is that basically taper lock between the case and the breach of the firearm. If you're just out plinking on the range, then hey, you know, whatever. Just about anything goes for things that aren't trying to hurt you or don't shoot back. <laughs> so, uh, sure. But if you're looking at something that's a little bit more dangerous, like maybe you're going pig hunting or something like that, hey, you might want to consider going to one of those uh, hybrid firearms that uses an AK-47 magazine. So in order to talk about the next caliber that is a quote-unquote underbuilt situation, 
uh, we have to talk about a caliber that actually works, and that caliber that actually works is 458 SOCOM. I would say that uh, 458 is really the maximum for the AR. Uh, basically, what they've done is they've taken a an AR-15 magazine that holds 28 rounds and converted it to a single-stack 10-round magazine to be able to deliver 45 caliber pills at high energy. It still suffers from that carved out bolt that we talked about with the 7.62x39, but because of the lack of feed issues, it's generally not considered a problem because you're not getting that dead end contact with the bolt face and a obstructed case. Which brings me to the 450 Bushmaster, which is basically the straight walled equivalent of the 458 SOCOM for shitty states like mine that require straight walled cartridges for deer hunting. Since the bolt already existed for 458 SOCOM, they basically adapted it to be used in this design. Because it's a straight wall case, it has horrific feed issues that require specific considerations in feed ramp and magazine design. And the round is also higher pressure than 458, and the guns just simply rattle apart, particularly if you're talking about manufacturers that are targeting the bottom of the barrel. I've got myself a 5.56 AR-15, and I think I want to go hunt some deer this year with my black gun, so I'm going to go buy me a new upper and uh, just shoot them big pills down there. If you're going out and shooting ones and twosies, then fine, but those guys that are out there shooting upwards of 40, 50 hogs a night just simply aren't using it. Since we spoke a little bit about upscaling to AR-10s for some of those calibers, like uh, 762 by 39 in the form of the uh, Mark 47, It'd be a good time to talk about the transition to long range because you know AR-10s are typically considered the go-to gas gun for long range. AR-10s, uh, 308, 65 Creedmoor usually uh, have very low parts breakage rates, and that's simply because the parts are huge. If you look at an AR-10 bolt compared to an AR. A 15 bolts like it's a it's a big chunk of metal however because you've got a lot more large parts moving around the guns tend to be a, a little bit more ammo selective so you're probably going to end up needing to have some kind of adjustability on that firearm to make sure that you can really dial it in particularly if you're using it for any kind of serious purpose again like shooting animals that you know, may be a threat to you uh, sometimes i mean you look at those herds of those hogs down there and they're like hundreds of hogs at a time they got really sharp tusks and if they're cornered they can do some real damage to you all right let's get into the meat and potatoes overbuilt in capabilities or overbuilt in dollar signs so did you spend more money on the gucci thing than you actually needed to do you really need the newest coating on all the things so you've got your uh, general use ar which in my opinion comes in like really two uh, different things you get the basic rifle and you got the do everything rifle so uh, the basic rifle, I'll give you an example of my basic rifle. I have a walking gun, so I like to go walking out on the farm for a little bit more exercise in addition to my weightlifting regimen. And uh, my walking rifle is a 10 and a half inch SBR. And all it's got are open sights on it, some kind of peep sight that's just a simplistic sight, and a can. I have pistols that rival the weight of that SBR. And it's just a really handy rifle that it'll give me all the capabilities chambered in 300 blackout. I use full powered ammunition in it. And I have shot coyotes, I have varmints, all of the above with that rifle. Supremely accurate, handy, doesn't weigh a whole lot, doesn't really encumber my experience of being out and walking around getting some exercise. And then there's the do everything rifle, which is like somebody buys a rifle and they want to bolt a whole bunch of stuff to it so that they can feel as though they've got a rifle to do everything. I'm going to tell you right now, these suck. Do not do this. The concept that you can have one rifle that does everything. Yes, you can. But that thing is going to be so stinking heavy that you're not going to want to do anything with it. I don't consider myself a weak person. In fact, uh, if you look at my numbers on some of my compound lifts, they're relatively high compared to your normal human out there. So wh what I would say is that uh, when you go out and use stuff, particularly if you're using it in any kind of kit, you're going to want to shave as much weight off of it as you possibly can. There's good weight versus bad weight. 
it is much better to specialize that firearm. And in my mind, there are really two types of specialized rifles. There's the DMR style rifle. So uh, I guess there's three categories. There's the normal kind of like basic run your mill AR that you got out there in various configurations. But then you get the special guns. The special guns are like the special purpose rifle, the DMR rifle that is specialized for the like three to 600 yard range. And then you got the night guns. These are vastly different builds. So those DMR style guns, you're gonna be looking at longer barrels, usually a, a little bit heavier of a barrel, but not necessarily, uh, depending on the round count. Uh, we're gonna get into barrels in just a, just a minute, so just leave that one in the wings. You might want a heavy barrel, depending on the volume that you're gonna shoot. I used to suggest a, an 18 inch barrel, but really you don't really need an 18 inch barrel. A 16 inch barrel is plenty long. The consideration with an 18 inch barrel is depending on how tall you are, particularly if you're running a can on the end of it, you're gonna be banging yourself in the ankles with it. It's a lot more difficult to move around with an, a gun with an 18 inch barrel on it. So I'm saying that if you got a one in seven twist 16 inch barrel, you're probably all right. But if you wanna squeeze that last little bit of velocity out of those two inches of barrel, then cool, I wouldn't go any longer than 18. Optics for this, uh, somewhere around the 4 to 10x magnification range uh, is usually where people kind of land. Uh, you're really not talking about shooting out to distances of like 800 plus yards where you're going to need more magnification than that. On standard silhouette style targets, 600 yards and in, a 4x to 10x magnification, you can get it done if you do your part. Most of the weight of these guns is going to be concentrated in the barrel, the optics, and the bipod. Conversely, if we go to the night gun, uh, we've got a defined range of about 400 yards and in. And most of the weight in this gun, while they may be very similar to the uh, SPR or DMR type rifle in the weight category, uh, most of the weight here is going to be concentrated in your accessories. The reason I say that the night gun is for 400 yards and in is usually when we're talking about night guns, at least anybody who's doing it for real is talking about using night vision. And and I actually had this debate today with my brother. We were talking about defining a range for this and we came to the consensus that 400 yards is basically the distance that if you've got somebody who's not silhouetted or a, an animal that's not silhouetted against, uh, say they've got a backdrop of like a wooded area or something like that with no supplemental lights or anything like that, then about 400 yards is where you're gonna be able to pick out that, that quarry. If it's out in the middle of a field, well, there's been some critical errors that have been made uh, to silhouette yourself like that. But if you're talking even in a full moon, somebody or something out there at 400 yards against a wood line, you are not gonna see that. So what that means is that at 400 yards and in, we don't really need those long barrels. We don't need those 16 inch or 18 inch barrels. We can sacrifice some of that weight of the barrel and some of that velocity and some of that lethality out to those longer distances for that sweet spot of 400 yards and in. And that makes those guns a little bit more carryable until you start adding a whole bunch of stuff to them, which you're gonna need to do. You almost always, when you're shooting uh, under night vision, you're gonna want a suppressor. You're gonna need it because it really disrupts your night vision. If you don't have a suppressor, it could be very disorienting. So you wanna keep that flash down. Aiming, you're gonna need some kind of electronic sight. I'm gonna tell you that right now. Uh, passive aiming is a difficult thing to do depending on what kind of optic you have. Uh, I gravitate towards either something like the Trijicon SRS, the, uh, the Hollow Sun stuff if you're going cheapy, uh, or the one that uh, I like the most is the EOTech, the night vision compatible EOTechs. Just because they get that big ring, it's really easy to pick up. Because like we were talking about earlier with the human vision, you're really good at finding the center of things, but that's in your world. <laughs> As in you have become very accustomed to operating in the focal planes that you're used to looking through. Some people that have glasses might have a little bit different perspective on this than I do, but as somebody who doesn't wear corrective lenses at all, I put a night vision device in front of my face and it becomes very difficult for the first uh, couple minutes to, to really orient yourself three-dimensionally to your rifle. And when you start doing things uh, through the night vision device and then through the optics of your of your firearm, that 
trickery that we use to find the center of things can sometimes betray you. For instance, for those of you who don't know what it is I'm talking about, pick up your rifle next time you're out shooting or whatever, and just pay attention to what you do with your head when you sight the rifle. Usually you pick the rifle up, you mount it to your shoulder, and then uh, in the process of doing that, you've raised the rifle to your eye. Well, I tend to cant my head forward ever so slightly. Well, if you do that with a night vision device, you're now looking at the ground. You're no longer looking through your sights or your optic, you're staring at the, at the floor. Because now, remember, you are limited to the field of view through the night vision device. You can no longer use the full range of motion of your eyes. Let's see, suppressor, uh, optics, lasers. The easiest way to aim under night vision, particularly at the closer ranges, is some kind of projected laser. In order to do that, I'm going to point you forward to the section on the handguards and the considerations that you need for that. But there's two types of aiming lasers. There's the, the full powered stuff and then there's the civvy legal stuff. There's a lot to do about this. I'm going to tell you that you do not need a full powered laser. If you put the full powered laser on something like a steel plate at like 200 yards, uh, the glare off of that plate is going to white out your night vision. So unless you're giving Morse code in laser beeps, then really you don't have to worry about that. Of course, everything that we've talked about up to this point pertaining to the night gun deals with the night vision stuff. And well, we're putting a whole lot of eggs in one basket that runs on this somewhat fragile device that puts in front of your face that can mess with your ability to perceive your environment. You might run into things, you might run out of batteries. So I would say that your night gun definitely needs to have some kind of uh, backup iron sight that is fitted with tritium vials. Especially if we're talking about home defense guns, you definitely want to be able to pick up those sights when the lighting conditions may not be in your best favor. As I mentioned previously, both of those guns are going to weigh roughly the same. It's just going to be how they concentrate their weight. You're going to have one that's concentrated in all the accessories, cans, lights, lasers, sights, optics, things like that. And the other one is going to be mostly in barrel and, and optics. If you're trying to shave weight by adding ultralight handguards and things like that, you're really not saving yourself that much. And uh, again, we'll talk about handguards in here in just a second. In both instances, uh, those two guns need to likely have some way to tune them. The DMR gun, we're using a semi gun so that we can get uh, fast follow-up shots. The ammo is probably a little bit higher grade to reach out and touch things. And whatever you're shooting at when you're using a DMR style gun is likely elusive. And if you have a stoppage, that thing is, you're not, probably not gonna get another chance. When it comes to night guns, try to fix a habitual stoppage in the dark. It, it really sucks. So what I would suggest on both of these guns is uh, two points of adjustment. The buffer counts as one, so you can, I, I like to say that there's a, a gross adjustment. You play with the buffer weight and that kind of gets you close. And then you fine adjust the thing with a adjustable gas block of some kind on the front. You don't have to be real fancy on those adjustable gas blocks. There are many variants out there. I prefer the detent style ones than the screw. Uh, port ones just because things can fall out. I would also argue that at least the night gun needs to have some kind of battery assist feature like a forward assist or a reciprocating charging handle because in the dark you're very reliant on regimented fixes. There's not a whole lot of like what's wrong with it, how do I fix it? You kind of have to run through the battery of things to fix the gun and hope that one of them works because you can't really see anything that you're doing right up close where the firearm is unless you want to take the time to adjust your night vision device to the focal depth of where your hands are and sometimes that can be hard to do depending on how your device is set up. The heart of every firearm is its barrel and the rifle is no different and I would say that there's probably the most minutia to talk about when it comes to rifle barrels more than the other ones that are out there uh, just because rifles have such a wide variety of applications. So when it comes to AR-15s generally speaking there are three twist weights, rates that you're going to come across. The 1 in 9, the 1 in 8, and 1 in 7. What that means is that that is one twist for every so many inches of barrel. So a one and nine twist would be one twist, one complete revolution of the rifling per nine inches of barrel, eight and seven as, as denoted. So what I would say to you is that if you are building one of these rifles that we're talking about, which is either the uh, 
the DMR style or the uh, night gun that you're going to basically lose the one and nine twist because in both situations, usually when you're talking about your DMR style gun, you're probably shooting a little bit heavier projectile. You're probably going to want a little bit uh, faster twist rate to be able to stabilize those projectiles. So one and eight or one and seven is going to be more in your wheelhouse when you're shooting those types of uh, munitions. And remember when we talk about that night gun, we've already hacked away a section of that barrel to kind of make room for the, the weight that we want to save. So you've already compromised the amount of barrel that you have, so you wanna go with a higher twist rate generally to be able to get that stabilization. So you wanna go with that one and eight or one and seven. One of my SBRs is a one and eight. Uh, the rest of them are in one and seven. There's a lot to do about coatings on barrels. Chrome lined, nitride, QPQ, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And I have a two factor authentication for you to determine whether or not you need a chrome lined barrel. The first factor is, is that firearm a machine gun? The second is, are you operating in a maritime environment? What I mean by that is, are you getting in and out of the water, submersing your rifle in salt water? If both of those criteria are not true, then you do not need a chrome lined barrel. You'd be just as well served with a nitride barrel or something else. And one of the things that is often missed, especially with people who are purchasing lower end uh, chrome line barrels, is chrome line barrels almost always, as long as we're doing peer to peer comparisons, chrome line barrels are almost always less accurate than something like their nitride counterpart. When that nitride barrel is cut, the final dimensions of that barrel are as they are when it comes off of the machine. Nitriding is a non-additive process, meaning that it takes some of the material that is there and converts it to the nitride finish. Chrome line barrels, by contrast, are not the correct dimensions when they come off of the machines. They then have to be coated in chrome to reach that final dimension. So when your chrome line barrel comes off of the machine, it's actually overboard, and then the addition of that chrome then brings it up to the correct bore dimension. There's also the chance that the lining could have uh, inconsistencies in it that probably smooth themselves out, but generally speaking, if you want a really accurate barrel, you're lo not looking for a chrome line barrel. Those are generally for longevity, as in we're gonna run this thing really hot, really fast, and we're gonna dunk it in salt water on a continuous basis. The thickness of the barrel can be a point of contention. One of the things that we have to consider when we're talking about uh, the thickness of the barrel is the heat retention versus dissipation. A thick barrel is going to heat up slower than a thin barrel, but it's also going to retain the heat longer. This also plays with how much the barrel flexes or whips when it's in the firing sequence as the bullet is moving down the, the bore of the firearm it is creating a pressure wave and it's causing that metal to flex just like any tube that you have you take a toilet paper roll tube and squeeze on it it's going to flex same thing happens at the high pressures that a firearm is operating in it's just happening really fast and you can't see it these two things the heat retention and the amount of whip the barrel has can be used to guesstimate the dispersion of the firearm short thick barrels are gonna be pretty rigid. You're not gonna get a high amount of dispersion. The long, thin barrels are going to have a higher dispersion rate. That's fairly nuanced, but just know that if you're talking AR-15s, generally speaking, I like to go for a medium taper barrel if we're talking the, uh, the long range guns. It doesn't really matter as much on the short range guns uh, because just simply we're talking about shooting stuff 400 yards and in there's not enough whip to really cause you to miss because of heat dispersion or uh, the barrel just being a wet noodle. Which brings us to handguards. So should you free float the handguard? Does it matter? And when does it matter? So the free float of a handguard is done because if you have multiple points of contact on the barrel, then anything that you do to the handguard can change the harmonics of that barrel. So a free-floated handguard by definition is a handguard that only touches the barrel in one point. So there is no uh, forward touching of the barrel 
and it can't really mess with the harmonics no matter what you do to it. Whereas if you were attached to two points, anything that you put in the center is going to change the way the center of the barrel vibrates. So when does this matter? Well, in two instances related to our two special guns, if we're talking about that DMR gun that we're shooting out past 400 yards, uh, that sort of stuff starts to matter. So if you're pushing on it, it can, it can really matter. But the other uh, double-edged sword there is if you're putting a lot of pressure on that handguard, that you can actually cause the handguard to walk, uh, as in you can flex the handguard. If you're using sights that are mounted to that free-floated handguard and you put a lot of pressure on the front of the handguard, the barrel will no longer be pointed where the front sight is. So keep that in mind. The other reason you would want a free-floated handguard is to be able to mount uh, that aiming laser on it. Generally speaking, it's just easier to mount accessories on a free-floated handguard, especially critically aligned accessories like an aiming laser. That handguard needs to have considerations for anti-rotation and anti-walk characteristics. We don't want that thing moving around. If you're doing that aiming laser, I suggest that you have a full length Picatinny rail across the top. It doesn't have to be the full cheese grater, but across the top rail, it should be a full 1913 Picatinny rail, just because you're gonna need all the real estate that you can get to be able to mount that laser, your sights, and your optics. And if you're putting any other devices, like maybe you've got a laser that isn't coupled with an infrared illuminator, then yeah, you're gonna need space to mount that as well. And then today we're gonna wrap up with the internals. Most of the stuff that people do to the internals of their rifles are a personal preference side of things. But one of the really good uh, things that you can do uh, to increase the effectiveness of your DMR style rifle would be to get a lighter trigger. Oftentimes, if you spend a lot of time shooting the, the light triggers and then you transition back over to the heavy triggers, you can watch the sights walk as you apply the pressure to the trigger. That's obviously not a good thing, but if you are used to shooting heavier triggers then you can overcome it, but it just does make it a little bit easier. But as far as the rest of the internals are concerned, the main thing that I would tell you to do when it comes to uh, setting up the internals of your gun is to look at coatings that are designed to enhance the cleaning aspect of things. You're not really gonna gain longevity of the firearm by going to a chrome bolt or a nickel boron bolt or a, a, a DLC bolt. Like it doesn't really matter that much as far as the, the stress on the parts, what they're finished in. What does matter, however, is how easy it is to get them clean to keep that firearm running. You can also, if you're going for something like the chrome or the nickel boron bolt, imperfections in the coating can be indicative of uh, impending doom, if you will. So if you start seeing pits in your chrome on your chrome plated bolt, then you can guess that there might be something wrong with the underlying metal or at least have the idea that you need to focus on those particular areas as you continue to PM those firearms. Again, as far as the longevity argument is concerned, I have basic bitch original 1980s parts that don't have any of those fancy special coatings in them. Those guns have tens of thousands of rounds on them that are doing just fine. Those trigger groups still work. The, there's no real major damage to any of the parts as far as the longevity is concerned, uh, and they don't use any of those fancy coatings. So you're not, don't believe the machine that we talked about earlier when it tries to tell you that you need those to enhance the, the life of those parts. You're probably gonna end up tearing it apart and replacing the springs long before you are worried about cracking a hammer or something like that. Anyway, that was our deep dive on, is it overbuilt? If you guys have any questions, then please feel so inclined to either message me directly or put it in the comments section of the YouTube version of this uh, podcast. And I can't thank you enough because this topic came directly from the audience. So hopefully we'll see you on a future episode here at the Armed and Nerded Podcast.